Hi, Kirk Sorensen. Nice to be here. I'd like to take you on a little trip around the solar system. We'll start with uh, the planet Jupiter, which is like a miniature solar system all of its own. And it's got extraordinary moons like the volcanic moon Io and the cracked and frozen moon Europa, which may hide an ocean of liquid water and perhaps even life under its thick ice. We move on to the ringed planet Saturn and its giant moon Titan, which has an atmosphere twice as thick as the Earth's. With radar technology, we've been able to peer through Titan's atmosphere and see its surface features. And we found an alien geography shaped by liquid ethane that flows like water does on Earth, carving channels and filling lakes and oceans. Mimas is a battered moon of Saturn whose surface is dominated by a huge crater. And we can't escape the impression that there's something about Mimas that maybe we've seen before. That's no moon. It's a space station. Enceladus is an icy moon with geysers of liquid water that might also harbor a liquid water ocean under its surface, under its thick ice like Europa, and with that liquid water, perhaps the hope of finding life. Tiny Phoebe lies on the very edge of Saturn's system of moons. And Saturn has some electrifying polar weather, as you can see from this picture. This incredible picture was taken from behind Saturn looking back at the sun. Do you see that tiny dot right there? That's us. We've taken a picture of Saturn and caught ourselves in the picture. And we plunge onward, deeper into the darkness, passing the planet Uranus with its diversity of moons, and even on to the mighty blue planet of Neptune and its large moon Triton. Triton is another world where we found geologic activity, nitrogen geysers and cryogenic volcanoes. In a few more years, we may even get a picture like this as our robotic eyes fly past Pluto and look backward. I hope you've enjoyed this incredible journey. It was made possible by thousands of very intelligent, very hardworking people over the last 50 years, many of whom lived right here in California and worked at NASA's Ames Research Center and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They built spacecraft with computers, antennas, instrument sensors, and telescopes. They put them on huge rockets and flew calculated trajectories with extraordinary precision. But without one key material, none of this would have been possible. This is plutonium-238. It's a radioactive material that has a half-life of 87 years. Every year, about 1% of this plutonium decays and emits high-energy helium and a lot of heat. Now, don't confuse plutonium-238 with its more well-known sister isotope, plutonium-239. Plutonium-238 has no use in nuclear weapons. This is a device that we've used to turn the decay heat of plutonium-238 into electrical energy. It's called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG, and each spacecraft we've sent beyond the asteroid belt has had one or more. Despite the poor conversion efficiency of thermoelectric technology, RTGs have been popular because they're very rugged and they have no moving parts. Plutonium-238 is highly radioactive, but since its alpha particle emissions are easily shielded against, RTGs can be quite safe to work around. The Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft both had four RTGs. They were the first spacecraft to Jupiter and Saturn. The famous Voyager spacecraft each had three RTGs. Voyager 2 was the first spacecraft to Uranus and Neptune. The Galileo spacecraft had two larger and more modern RTGs. Galileo was the first spacecraft to orbit the planet Jupiter and took most of the photographs of Jupiter and its moons that I showed you earlier. The Cassini spacecraft had three of these larger RTGs. Cassini is the first spacecraft to orbit the ringed planet Saturn and has discovered the rivers and lakes of Titan, the geysers of Enceladus, and the incredible weather of Saturn. And this is the New Horizons spacecraft. It has the last RTG that we originally built as a spare for Cassini. It's on its way to Pluto right now and will be the first spacecraft to visit that distant world in 2015. Many different radioisotopes have been considered for RTGs. There are several basic requirements. The radioisotope needs to have a half-life several times longer than the expected mission duration, and its emissions should be easy to shield against. 
Based on these two requirements, plutonium-238 has consistently been the popular choice for RTGs. Plutonium-238 was produced at special facilities in the Savannah River plant in South Carolina. For reasons that I'll explain, you can't make plutonium-238 by itself in normal uranium-fueled reactors during the course of typical operation. In a typical uranium-fueled reactor, the fuel consists of two isotopes of uranium, uranium-235, which is fissile, and uranium-238, which is not. Only a few percent of the uranium in a typical reactor is uranium-235, but that material is the starting point for the production of plutonium-238. When uranium-235 is struck by a neutron, it will fission about 85% of the time. But in the 15% of the cases where it doesn't fission, it will absorb the neutron and form uranium-236, which will go on to absorb another neutron and form uranium-237. Uranium-237 will beta decay with a half-life of seven days into Neptunium-237, which is chemically distinct from uranium and can be separated. But if you continue to expose Neptunium-237 to neutrons, eventually it will absorb one and form Neptunium-238, which will then decay with a half-life of two days into Plutonium-238. So that's the long and relatively slow process by which Plutonium-238 is produced. The reason why uranium reactors aren't a good source of Plutonium-238 is because of the presence of Uranium-238, which makes up the bulk of the nuclear fuel. Uranium-238 will absorb a neutron, forming Uranium-239, which will then beta decay with a half-life of 23 minutes to Neptunium-239, which will also beta decay with a half-life of two days to Plutonium-239. Further neutron absorptions will form Plutonium-240 and 241. Because all of these plutonium isotopes are chemically identical to one another and their masses are so similar, it is virtually impossible to separate them from one another. When we look at the isotopic content of the plutonium formed in a typical uranium-fueled reactor, it's easy to see from that little green sliver that very little plutonium-238 is formed, and it's mixed with four other plutonium isotopes from which it cannot be practically separated. Since it's nearly impossible to make plutonium-238 of an acceptable quality in a uranium-fueled reactor during the course of normal operations, a, diff a different technique was used to make all of the plutonium-238 we've used up to this point. They started with neptunium, which was extracted from spent nuclear fuel and then exposed to neutrons to form neptunium-238, which decayed to plutonium-238. Since the original target was only neptunium, the vast majority of the plutonium produced was plutonium-238. Making plutonium-238 from neptunium targets is long and complicated work. Only about 10 to 15 percent of the neptunium will form plutonium-238 on any particular session of exposure, and each session involves dissolving exposed targets in nitric acid, separating neptunium and plutonium from one another, and recycling the unconsumed neptunium, and then fabricating new targets. The radioactivity levels of the materials in the fission products mean that work has to be done in remote facilities similar to this chemical separation line at the Savannah River site. In part because of the difficulty and expense of making plutonium-238, the United States stopped manufacturing this material in the late 1980s. But we didn't stop using it for our deep space probes and our inventories have dwindled considerably. In the mid-1990s, we bought about 16 kilograms from the Russians, but they've stopped producing it as well and the next two spacecraft that we have planned will consume our remaining inventory. NASA has a whole list of missions queued up to use plutonium-238 in the future, and their demand for the material will require that over 100 kilograms of new material be produced. We, need to start producing the, we needed to start producing this material two years ago to meet planned mission demands. Now we're getting further behind, and even with the old technique, it's uncertain we'll be able to make enough plutonium-238 to catch up to national needs. What we need is a better way, a way to make plutonium-238 at the same time as making money from the production of power. I have an idea. We need a reactor that doesn't have the problems of the uh, uranium reactor. We need a thorium reactor. And that might not come as a surprise to you. Thorium reactor started on a very rare and valuable material, uranium-233. Uranium-233 will fission about 90% of the time when it's struck by a neutron producing neutrons that are used to convert thorium-232 into thorium-233, 
which then beta decays into protactinium-233 and into new uranium-233. Thorium-uranium-233 is unique as the only nuclear fuel that it can accomplish this in a thermal spectrum reactor. But 10 percent of the time, uranium-233 will absorb a neutron, forming uranium-234 and then uranium-235. Recall that uranium-235 is also fissile, fissioning about 85 percent of the time, and you probably remember the series of absorptions and decays that will lead to plutonium-238. The real significance of a uranium of a thorium fueled reactor is it can operate without any uranium-238, and so the production of other isotopes of plutonium is nearly eliminated. Uranium-233 is the key material to making this scenario a reality. At the Oak Ridge National Labs, there is currently about a thousand kilograms of uranium-233 stored in a variety of forms. Most of it would be directly useful to making energy from thorium. Unfortunately, the Department of Energy is currently planning to destroy this material at great expense to the tune of about $500 million. The way that uranium-233 is used to make energy from thorium is that it will absorb, it will generate two neutrons from fission, one of which will continue the fission process and the other of which will uh, begin the transmutation of new thorium into new uranium-233. So this process, once started in a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, can continue indefinitely, generating energy from thorium. This is a schematic of a two-fluid uh, liquid fluoride thorium reactor. The uranium-233 would sustain fission in the core, and thorium in the blanket would be generating new uranium-233. And then plutonium that would be very small amounts of plutonium that would be produced in here could be extracted chemically. The heat from the fission of uranium is used to drive a gas turbine power conversion system which generates electricity and rejects heat that could be used in a desalinization process. So uh, we can generate primary heat for power and also a very valuable byproduct in the form of desalinated water. Now if we committed this uranium-233 inventory to a liquid fluoride thorium reactor or lifter, it would produce about a thousand megawatts of electrical power. This would lead to an estimated $600 million in electricity sales per year, along with the production of roughly 15 kilograms of plutonium-238 for the space program. But there's a lot more that a lifter running on thorium could produce. It would generate 20 kilograms of molybdenum-99 for hospitals, which would mean hundreds of thousands of doses of this life-saving isotope for patients. It could generate 20 kilograms of radiostronium that could be used as heating units here on Earth for remote sites. It would generate 150 kilograms of stable xenon and neodymium that wouldn't be worth very much compared to the other products, but they'd more than pay for the thorium that it took to start, that it took to uh, keep running the reactor. Uranium-233 naturally decays to thorium-229 with a half-life of 160,000 years. That's a very slow rate of decay, but if you have 1,000 kilograms of uranium-233, it means you'll be getting about 4 grams of thorium-229 a year. And thorium-229 decays with a half-life of about 7,300 years to actinium-225, then to bismuth-213, and find it finally to stable bismuth-209, which is the active ingredient in Pepto-Bismol. There are promising medical investigations underway right now to use actinium-225 and bismuth-213 in targeted alpha radiotherapy trials. And what these involve is you develop a monoclonal antibody and you attach one of these, you attach bismuth-213, which is one of these radioisotopes that forms from the decay of uranium-233. That antibody binds directly to a cancer cell and as the bismuth-213 decays, that alpha particle gives a knockout punch to the cell and kills the cancer cell. So this is a technique to take a very potent radioisotope directly to the cells that need it. And early indications are that this technique could be revolutionary for cancer therapy. There was a report done for Congress about 10 years ago about extracting the thorium-229 precursor from the uranium-233 inventory at Oak Ridge, the 1,000 kilograms. And right now it appears that the only practical way to get thorium-229 is to extract it from this natural decay process. In fact, it's the only way I've been able to even conceive how to get thorium-229, which is the predecessor of this bismuth-213 that's used for cancer therapy. Bismuth-213 appears to be very potent, as it's stated in this report, so only a very minute quantity may be needed to treat a patient on order of a billionth of a gram. Well, with a 160,000-year half-life, uranium-233 decays very slowly. But if you had 
about 1,000 kilograms, you're making about 4 grams a year of thorium-229. If we could save the uranium-233 and extract the thorium-229, we could probably save thousands of lives through these new targeted alpha radiotherapy techniques. In fact, this is the only way to get this material, is to extract it from the uranium-233. If we save the uranium-233, we could build lifters that could make plutonium-238 for our deep space probes, and we might be able to launch probes like this to explore Europa and, and map under its ice. We might be able to send a probe out to Saturn and Titan that could drop a balloon in the atmosphere of Titan and, and float around and let us see what's really going on there for an extended period of time, all of it powered by two, plutonium-238. And perhaps someday a picture like this may be taken that would uh, inspire generations to come of, of the limitless possibilities of the exploration of space. Thank you very much.